but an apple pie. Okay. So, does it matter? Does leadership style matter? Well, um, I like to say, yeah, it does. <laughs> it does matter, leadership style matters. Those of you that have worked for toxic bosses in the past may be thinking right now of some of the negative implications, the negative connotations of working for a bad boss. I think there is a cost to be paid, but that cost is almost never captured. That cost is almost never captured. It doesn't hit the spreadsheets, doesn't hit the metrics, doesn't hit the scorecards. Um, and what are some of those costs? Well, let's look at a few that don't hit, uh, that we don't usually capture. 90% uh, of uh, physicians' visits are stress-related. What does working for a toxic boss do for you in terms of the stress level? Ratchets that bad boy right up to the top, aggravates you. Uh, what about domestic violence? What about alcohol use, absenteeism, drug use, all of those things? None of those costs are captured, and yet are they all logical downstream implications for working for the backbiting, belittling bastard boss from hell? <laughs> uh, Here's where I steal from your industry a little bit, right? And that is uh, our, our organizations, what if we thought of our organizations like big human batteries? That is to say, there's only so much potential to do work in them, right? There's only so much. Uh, people can only give you what they have to give you. Uh, it's a finite amount of energy. And most of that energy is used up just getting through the day. You've had those days, you go through all the day, and you, get, you come home and your spouse says, well, what did you do today? And you got nothing, but you're exhausted. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy just to get through the day. Uh, leadership plays a part in the energy level of organizations. I'm firmly convinced of that. So some leaders add energy to the organization, and some leaders drain it. In the Army, we call them sweat grenades. They come into a room and everybody bursts into sweat. There are these big personality people who everybody is so afraid of, they walk into the room and the tension level just skyrockets. You know those folks? And it's usually because of their interpersonal style or technique. It has nothing to do with their level of competence, but it has everything to do with how they treat people on a recurring basis. That pattern of behavior that's perceived over time. Good leaders add value, bad leaders drain value. And some have a style that is so bad <laughs> that they are a detriment to their organizations. The mission doesn't get accomplished because of them, it gets accomplished in spite of them. Some of you may have worked for some of those people. So, it's this one. Sarge is leaving to go to an advanced training course. I know, the men are having a party. When's the party? Just as soon as he goes away. Some of you have participated in those parties. Some of you may have organized those parties. I know I've been in that group uh, as well. So what is toxic leadership? Here's my definition, and you're free to argue it with me. First of all, lack of concern for the well-being of the people in the organization. That's step number one. Step number two, their interpersonal technique negatively affects the organizational climate. That is the feeling of the organization. They drain the feeling. They drive people down. And then third, uh, this conviction by subordinates that leaders motivated primarily by self-interest. Now, there's where you could argue with me. You could say, okay, George, I got you with the first point and the second point, but aren't we done? Isn't that enough? Well, I'm adding the third point because of one guy, one guy that I had a lot of experience with. By the way, toxic leaders, they typically have nicknames. Stormin', Ragin', Zapper, Nukem. My guy was Nukem, okay? And uh, Nukem was a guy who had an interpersonal technique that was negative. He was a blowtorch, a human blowtorch. And uh, he apparently didn't seem to care much about anybody around him. Uh, but the, the thing that, we, that gave him some slack was the fact that he, I, we really believed, the people in the organization really believed that he was harder on himself than he was on us. And he was doing what he was doing because he felt he had to for the benefit of everybody. So he wasn't trying to get ahead at our expense. He was trying to make, push the organization to a new level and because of his motivation, because we perceived his motivation as being that, uh, not being that third point, we were willing to go along with him. We, we gave him a break for that. Now, did I ever want to work for him again? No, okay? I wouldn't. I'll, uh, nobody that I knew ever wanted to work for him either. But the truth is, he was not motivated by self-interest. He was truly selfless, and that makes a difference. See, everybody in this room has a meter for uh, whether someone's trying to get ahead at your expense or not, especially your boss you know if your boss is trying to get, a, get ahead over your carcass. And you don't like it. <laughs> Everybody here, nobody likes that. So it makes it worse. Uh, Robert Sutton wrote a pretty good book. <laughs> <laughs> a 
Robert Sutton from uh, Stanford. Now, I don't use profanity in my presentations. I try not to. I believe it, it reflects a lack of vocabulary. But <laughs> Robert Sutton comes from a more prestigious university than the University of San Diego, I'm sorry to say. So I'm going to go ahead and use the term. And he says colorfully that uh, toxic leaders should be called assholes. Um, and so test number one is, does the target feel oppressed, energized, or belittled? And number two, does the alleged asshole aim his venom at people who are less powerful? See, that's really important. Because toxic leaders, they kiss up and they kick down. See, I've been haunted by this question. Why do otherwise world-class organizations put up with toxic leaders in their midst? Why are there so many of them? And why is it okay and otherwise great? Or why aren't organizations themselves filtering out these people? Why are they allowing them to perpetuate their venom on subordinate? I, don't wonder, I, I had a hard time figuring that out. Well, part of it is this problem right here, see? They don't look toxic to their bosses. They look responsive to their bosses. They're kissing up and kicking down. And as a friend of mine once said, this is the monkeys in the trees syndrome, George. And I said, what do you mean by monkeys in the trees? He said, well, you know, the high status monkeys, they are in the top branches where the fruit's the ripest. And so they're up at the top branches looking down. And when you're looking down from the top, what do you see? A bunch of bright and shining monkey faces smiling back at you. But if you're on the lower branches looking up, <laughs> it's a different view. It's a bunch of big, red, hairy monkey butts getting ready to dump on you all the time. So, so yeah, so that's what they do. The toxic leaders, they uh, tear up people who are less powerful, yet they're very obsequious and responsive to people who are more powerful than they are. As a rule, as a rule. So is this an organizational problem? I think so. Um, people ask me in the Q&A all the time, why are they so toxic? And my answer is, I don't know. I don't care. It's an organ for me, it's an organizational issue. Right? If you're a world-class organization, you don't want people like that ruining your climate. But we do. They leave a wake. Uh, and the higher they are in the organization, the bigger wake do they cast. In the Army, we had this problem. We called it the head slap phenomenon. Uh, we would post the promotions uh, in the hallways. So when everybody got promoted, we'd put the list of all the people who got considered for promotion and all the people who got promoted. And you would see this phenomenon. People would be going down the list and they'd find it, the name, the toxic guy, and they'd stop, and they'd go like this. <laughs> oh my God, how could they do that? How could they promote this person? Well, the problem is our personnel system doesn't necessarily distinguish between those who are effective and toxic from those who are effective and otherwise leading in a way that's in concert with the goals and values of the organization. Yes, sir. Uh, George, just clarify for me, I think you started off your presentation with this comment, but I want to kind of tie it back in with what you're saying here. Superiors don't see these negative effects or costs because they're looking down. Does that kind of imply that there's not an independent metric of this cost? Yes. So it's not showing up in organizational performance? That is correct. And why, we already established in the very beginning that if if you're good and you believe in the mission, you're going to get the job done. Whether you're, so it, it doesn't tr necessarily translate into organizational effectiveness as we currently measure it. But a, a bigger, a different kind of measure might pick up on some of the impact. 